All right, good morning. Welcome to those of you that are in Phoenix. If you're new, we are certainly happy that you're joining us today. Uh, for those of you that are watching us anyway, you found us online, apps, Roku, or YouTube. We're glad you're joining us also. If you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. Uh, you can get handouts for today's lesson, catch up on this entire series we've been doing in the book of Acts. We've split the series up into about, I think this is our fifth section of it. We're calling this one Unfinished, and we will be finished with Acts next week. Like, nobody could be more excited than me. It has been a long couple years trying to get through this book. Book. But anyway, so um, before we go into the lesson, I just want to answer one question that people came up and asked after Abby Reich. Abby Reich was our guest speaker last week. And for some reason, she never made this clear to people. So, uh, and I know I've told you, but for those that are watching online or however, but they wanted to know why she wasn't in the car with her family. And the reason for it was because, did, we, did she talk about that? I don't think she did either. Okay. Um, so the reason why was because she just had a two-and-a-half-week-old baby, and so she uh, felt like she was having a heart attack. So her husband said, well, I don't really want to take the kids to the hospital, so you go to the hospital and have the doctor check out. I will take the kids and go, like, to the park or wherever they went. So that's how that all happened. She went to the hospital by herself. She was sitting there trying to get a hold of her husband. He wasn't answering. She said she never even saw a doctor because she, got, she just knew something was not right. And so she left, went to where, the road where she thought he was, and that's where she saw the accident. Um, but she said she never, ever had another heart issue since then. So it was a very random thing that... God just used to do whatever he needed to do. So anyway, so today I want to piggyback off of pretty much what Abby talked about last week. And my question I want to ask us is, how can I keep believing? How can I keep on believing when everything in my life seems so dark? And the answer today is going to have to do with a puzzle. Now, I tell you, I don't normally like do the illustrations ahead of time and try to figure them out. And this one, we tried to work on it this morning, and it's going to be a disaster. So just an FYI, getting the pieces at the right place and all that. So when we get to it, just plan on it. Okay. Here's the deal. Craig Rochelle wrote a book. This is the name of the book. It's called, oh, that, I guess I don't send very good files. Anyway, it's called Hope in the Dark. And um, Craig Rochelle wrote it. He's a pastor. And he started out the book, and he talks about Marcy and Mark. And Marcy and Mark, uh, you know, have this great Christian marriage. He's a great Christian guy. They serve God together. Uh, they, they, you know, they fell in love. They got married. They had, you know, a, they bought their beautiful home. Everything was just going great. And then she had a baby girl. And the, like, life could not be happier, basically, for them. And she said life was good until one day it wasn't, when her husband came home and said, I'm leaving you for one of your friends. Now, she said this was so far out of left field, she had absolutely no idea. So now, she's a single mom, and she's trying desperately to get over the betrayal of her husband and her friend and, and all of this until one day, her fifth grade daughter came home, and she said, Mom, I don't feel very good. She took her to the doctor and found out she had cancer. And the doctor said, there's nothing we can do, and you can just make her comfortable until she dies. Now, that's a bad, dark dark time in your life when everything comes crashing down. And here is what Craig said. He said, as I stood there in that bleak hospital hallway, the tireless Marcy I had once known was long gone, swallowed up by this weary, defeated woman. She was beyond exhaustion, past depression, dangerously discouraged. She grasped desperately for anything remotely resembling that bottomless faith that used to come to her so easily. But her unshakable trust in God was nothing more than a sad memory. She drew a deep breath, fighting back the sobs. She sighed and said, I really want to believe that God's with me right now. I mean, I want to know that he's good and that he cares, and I want that so badly. I want to trust. I just don't know how. And I think that a lot of us, if you're going through some really dark times in your life, you can understand that. That makes total sense what Marcy is saying. You want to trust God, but you just kind of don't know how because everything in your world is falling apart. Now, the last lesson we did in Acts, we talked about this whole idea of what it means to trust God. And 
so many of you are trusting God for things and God isn't coming through. And we came to the realization that trusting God doesn't mean we trust him to give us everything we want. It really means I'm trusting God to do what he needs to do in this situation and, and that he always has a purpose for what he's allowing in our life, no matter how dark those times are. So we need to understand that's what that means. But I think a lot of people honestly walk away from their faith. Is it cold in here already? Yes. Okay. So we need someone to go tell them, say, it's freezing. I don't know where Chrissy is or someone or Jean. Yeah, just say, it's, Lisa said, it's cold and to make it warm. Okay. Normally you put your jackets on about like 30 minutes into it, but not a minute. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a long morning if that's the case. But anyway, I think people walk away from their faith because they don't know how to deal with this and, and they stop believing. And so I want to encourage you today that if this is your life, we're going to put another book up here that you need to get a couple of these books today. Kyle Eilman wrote a book called Don't Give Up. Faith that gives you the confidence to keep believing and the courage to keep going. So these are some really good summer reading books for you. And, and if, if you're not going through anything, they're good books so that you have them, so you learn something so you can help other people when they're going through it. But in his book, he tells another hospital story of a family who they were having their, their, their baby and they were so excited the whole family was there. And he gets a call and they find out that the baby was stillborn. And nothing could be more shocking to this family. They were all excited. They were ready for this baby. Everything was fine. They had no idea. And Kyle walked into the room, and the father was holding his lifeless little baby in his arms. And this is what the dad said. He said, I guess this is when I find out if I really believe what I say I believe. See, I think tragedy does that for you. And I think all our lives, there's going to be times in our life that come along that never, ever make sense. And we turn on the news and we see the tsunamis and hundreds of thousands of people are just dead in just a, a fell swoop in a couple hours. And we see planes falling from the sky and we see car crashes and little kids dying of cancer and we see babies being born without breathing and kids starving and abused. We see all of this stuff. And we are confronted daily in our own lives along with the news and, and that's what we have to ask ourselves. I guess this is when I find out if I really believe what I say I believe. See, there's things I believe that aren't true, but the Bible's not one of those. The Bible is one of these things that I believe 100%. It's, it makes, it's the only thing in my life that makes sense. But there are things I believe that aren't true. One of them is this. We moved into our new house, and it's in the middle of the desert, mind you, and I believe that in our house, we would never, ever have a scorpion ever, okay? This house was so protected that, that I was like, we've, we've never seen them until last week. There was one in my bed. Yeah. Thank the Lord it was dead, but it was there. And I'm like, it just shattered my belief that my house was protected, okay? Now, I, I also believed that I'm still young and can see, okay? So here was else what I, this is my second belief that isn't true. So I'm walking through the laundry room, and I look down on the floor, because now I'm a little nervous about scorpions being in the house, and I look down, and there's this fuzzy thing down there, and of course I'm barefooted, and I take my foot and I kick it, and I'm like, well, that's a weird piece of lint, so I went and got my glasses. Another scorpion. Yeah. So then I look around, and I realize where they're coming in, because we have this door that never got sealed in the laundry room, so I think it somehow got caught up in the laundry when I threw it on the floor. Um, so there you go. And then, because I'm all worried about bugs and stupid scorpions, I had another thought. I believe someday I'm going to lose weight. <laughs> Not sure when that's going to happen, but I believe that until I walked by my bed yesterday morning, and I put my, was making my bed, I put my pillows up on the bed, and I looked down and there was a black bug, and it looked like a tick. And I'm like, oh, for the love. So I got my glasses on, and I looked down. It was a brownie. <laughs> I'm like, yep, I believe I'm going to lose weight, but if I'm eating brownies in bed, apparently that's not going to happen, okay? <laughs> but this is what we're learning all through Acts, that no matter whatever happened to Paul, he always believed what he said he believed. He just did. He just believed that God was good and that God was in it. He just knew that. 
But Paul had horrible days, as we've seen throughout the entire book of Acts. And yet, I think just like you and just like me, he had to do that. He had to look at the, the times and say, do I really honestly believe in this whole Jesus thing? And here are some things that you and I have to believe if we're followers of Christ. One is that there are greater things beyond this earth. Like we tend to think this earth is all it is and we just have to make everything here. But that's not true. What's beyond death here is so much greater than what we can imagine. And see, Paul lived his life with that in mind. And I think if you and I can live our life with that in mind, I think it kind of changed how we view our problems. Uh, the other thing that Paul has to believe is that Jesus is the only way to God. And we talk about that all the time in here, that Jesus said, I am the only way to God. If you're here and you're a religious person or you just go to church every so often or you just are a good person and you think, that's going to get me in, the Bible says that's not true. You have to place your faith in Jesus alone. That's, and Paul knew that. He stood on it. And that was one thing that he had to say he believed and that he actually did believe. See, you and I, when we die, if we're followers of Christ, we're going to go to a place where there is no sadness and tears and tsunamis and child cancer and, 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 and scorpions. None of, those things, none of those things will be in heaven, and that's a really good thing to know. But while on earth, here's the other thing that Paul had to realize, is that while I'm on earth, bad things are going to happen. We're going to get that. But here's what he knew, that God would use the dark times in our life and his life for good. And so the question we always ask is, how do I get to that point where nothing ever shakes our faith? Now, it was at this point that I was supposed to have a Bible up here, which of course is in the back and I forgot to bring it up. So we're going to pretend, uh, we're going to pretend this is a Bible. Okay, this is my Bible. Here's the bottom line. If this is the Bible, then I have to believe every single promise in here and I have to believe every single word that's in here. And if I can believe that 100%, then I do believe I can make it through whatever dark times I'm supposed to go through. But here's what I want us to do. And I, I don't know why this hit me, but I think we need to start looking at our life like a puzzle. And we're going to call our life this. God's life for me. Your life is filled with all these different puzzle pieces, and I want you to realize that it's God's life for you. Every one of us has different lives, different puzzles, different pieces that go into our puzzle. So here is our, some of you, you guys aren't going to be able to see this very well over here, so here's what you need to know first off in, in, in our puzzles, is this, you're not going to see this, that this says God created, God created you. God created you. Some people are here and you're like, well, I don't think God created me. I'm just an accident. No, you're not. Like God seriously created you. Here's what Jeremiah says. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He said that to Jeremiah and he says that to all of us. And he says, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet. Here's the deal. God ordained your birth to be the best wife, to be the best mother. You may not be Billy Graham, okay? But you can be, like I was thinking this morning of all the, the moms and the grandmas in the Bibles, in the Bible. That, that, that all these, they stood behind and they taught their kids the ways of, of, of Jesus. And because of that, you have generations that believe. So you're, you're, God created you for a very specific purpose. And some of you, it might just be you're the best neighbor, best wife, best grandmother, best, best mother. Okay, so that's it. Look at the other one. Psalms 139 says this, For you formed my inward parts. You, co you covered me in my mother's womb. So if you're here and you think like, oh, I don't really, you know, think God, you know, wanted me here. That's not true. So here's the deal for our puzzle. God created you. Then at some point, here you go, God saved you. That's a piece of the puzzle. And what you're going to see is every single one of these puzzle pieces, they all, they all go together. The third one is here. Some of you are married. Now, this could, this could say single to some of you, but for some of you, you're married, and that's a piece of the puzzle up here. Wow, if this thing actually stays, I'm going to be pretty impressed. Then here you go. Some of you job. You got a job promotion. Yay! job promotion. That's part, of your, that's part of your puzzle. All right, so that's one of those pieces. Trying to get these things to like actually click in is not very good. Then you have this one. Some of you have kids. And if, if, yours doesn't, if you're not married, you don't have kids, you can put dogs. Okay, whatever, whatever's part of your puzzle piece, whatever that fits in. So now you, so you see, your life is being created like a puzzle. Each particular piece is a part of your life. Then Here's the problem. Along with all the really cool stuff comes bad stuff. Here's loss, 
Some of you lost people, lost friends, lost children, lost whatever, but that's a part of your puzzle piece. And then you have this one. I even put, this is kind of a big deal, suicide. There's a lot of people. We have one woman in here that um, her husband committed suicide, and, and she has such this great attitude. She just wants to help people through it. So it's like you, you, she has a lot of this is going on in our world today, and that's, that it has affected some of your puzzles. What's this one? Prison. Some of you have kids in prison, husbands in prison. Maybe you're getting ready to go to prison. I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's, that's a piece of a lot of people's puzzle. Okay? And then the last two, divorce. Some of you in your puzzle have been divorced, and that's a big part of your life. So that's a piece of your puzzle here. Okay? And then some of you, what is the last one? Cancer. But whatever you want. Cancer, sickness, whatever. This is, this is a part to a lot of your puzzles, too. So now we have this puzzle. Now, the interesting part about this is that if I could actually get it to fit the pieces where they're supposed to be, they're all attached to this, where it says you're saved. And every one of your puzzle pieces are attached that, that intertwine with your salvation. God created you, and, and you are saved. Everything is attached to that particular piece. And we have to know that every single puzzle piece that we have, God wants to use. Because remember, if you're here and you're a Christian, it's not just so you can be happy and have a good life. It's so you can get what? This unfinished job out to tell other people about Jesus, which is your neighbors, your kids, your grandkids, whoever it is. That's what Acts is all about. It's, 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 we're, our job is to finish what Jesus started. And it's our job to get that message out. And so what God does is he uses our personal puzzles to do it. And whatever pieces you have in your puzzle, God wants to use that to point people to Jesus. He just does. And we've seen it with Paul all through Acts that no matter what bad puzzle piece comes into his life, because we've seen a lot of them. He's been in prison. He's been beaten and whipped and stoned to death. And that he didn't die, thank the Lord. He's been shipwrecked. He's been like everything has gone wrong and every puzzle piece is bad. And yet nothing sways Paul. He's like, bad puzzle piece, super awesome. Because you know what? I'm going to use that to further the gospel. But somehow... When you're going through all these bad things, the losses, the suicide, the prison, the cancer, whatever it is, it doesn't make it any easier. I look at so many of you people. I look at Cheryl Lynn's loss or Donna's loss or, or Abby's loss last week. And I think the only thing that makes that bearable is remember that God is the creator of our puzzle. You've got to get that. If you don't get that, you'll fall apart. And some of you here will be like, well, that's not, God didn't create divorce and loss and cancer and prison. Well, he didn't create it. It's part of a fallen world. And maybe he didn't create it, but he allowed it into your life, and he wants to use it. Because if he didn't, like, he could have stopped it. Like, I was thinking about this with Abby. Like, really? She has these heart palpitations. She goes one way, her family goes the other. Like, how weird is that? And yet, God could have stopped it. He could have made that driver that's driving 100 miles an hour veer to the right or veer to the left. God is big enough to stop it, but sometimes he doesn't. And if he doesn't, then that just means that God has something that he wants to use in your life. We have to trust God's life for me. We've got to do that. Now, in the Bible, what you're going to see is two different kinds of lives, two different kinds of puzzles that people's God's life for me is. And, and, and you're going to be portrayed in one of these two. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to call the first one this. Okay? It's your M&M life. Now, if you don't like M&Ms, this illustration is not going to work for you. So here's the deal. The M&M life to me is the perfect life, all right? It's colorful. It's, it's, it's chocolatey. It's yummy. It's good. It's like there's just everything's great about peanut M&Ms. So some of you get that. That's your life. Because the M&M life comes to people who, and you know them, and maybe some of you are them, you just don't suffer that much. You just don't. You have a good life. You have a good marriage. You have good kids. You have, like, there's just not much bad that's going on in your life. And God has people in the Bible that they have M&M lives. That's just the way it is. Hebrews 11 talks about this. These are, these are people who did amazing things for God, and they had these amazing feats of faith. 
You see Abraham and Sarah, and you see Samson and Jacob and Moses and Joshua, and they all had struggles, but overall, it was kind of pretty easy. And see, for some of you, you're the girl that got the job and got the guy and got the house and, and got the boat, and you stayed married and you never lost anyone, and every time you prayed, God just seemed to answer you. Some of you fit into this m M&M life, and the Bible talks about this here in Hebrews 11.33. You're the kind of people who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies, and women received back their dead, raised to life again. And some of you, that's your life. It's just simple. And honestly, God made it easy for you to believe. It's easy to believe when everything gets handed to you. For some of the people in the Bible, it was like this, Moses. How hard is it to trust God when you say, part, and the sea parts, okay? You walk through a parted sea, and then it comes crashing down on the Egyptians. It's pretty easy to believe in a God that comes through in miraculous ways like that. How easy was it for Joshua? Walks around seven times around the city of Jericho and... You know, blows the trumpet and the walls come crumbling down. Well, that doesn't happen unless it's miraculous. How about Sarah? She gets pregnant at what, 80, 90? I don't know. The, I can't even fathom that. Like, who would even want to do that? But, um, uh, but, but, but that's miraculous. So it's pretty easy for Sarah to believe. How about Samson? God gives him this miraculous strength. Easy to believe. See, here's the deal. It's easy to believe when God's always coming through for you. But some of you, it's not like that. You don't have the M&M life. Here's your life. I call you the rotten tomato life. Okay? Did I put a picture of that up there? No, I didn't. Why not? There it is. It's the rotten tomato life. It's all moldy and yucky. And, 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 and you're just like, yep, that's me. That's, that's what I'm going through right now. And those people that live in the rotten tomato life, you're the ones who didn't get the house and you didn't get the guy and you didn't have the bank account and your husband left you and you lost your job and your kids are off the rails. And maybe for you, you were born into poverty or there was a lot of abuse in your family or neglect. And for this group, we say this, it's a little harder to keep believing in a loving God who allows difficulty in their life. And yet for some reason, this group, this group... God has the most amazing things that he says. This group of people who keep their faith and say, you know what, I don't care if I live a rotten tomato life. I love Jesus no matter what. I look at Abby's life and some of you in here that are dealing with rotten tomatoes and I'm like, you are my heroes. And the reason for it is because you never give up on your faith. And I really believe it's because you believe with all your heart that what God has said is true. And here is you. You're this kind of person. Others, you know, the the rotten tomato life is like this. You're tortured, refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some face jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. Some of you feel like, oh my gosh, that's my life. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Look at this statement. The world was not worthy of them. Some of you that are going through really tough times and you're making it through, I feel like the world is not worthy of you because you are so incredibly awesome. Because you never give up. You just love Jesus no matter what. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes, and they were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what they had been been promised. It's like they never, ever gave up. And their puzzle pieces were so incredibly bad. But here's what we learn from people like that is you don't have to give up either. Oswald Chambers says this, Faith is deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. I don't know why some of you have M&M lives and some of you have rotten tomato lives. I don't know. I wish I could make it all better and tell you, but I just know that those of you that live rotten tomato lives, God is for you. Sometimes I think he's really for you, okay? Because it's hard to live like that with faith that you have. 
Craig Groeschel tells another story of a couple planning on adopting a baby. Um, the mother had had a couple different kids from different baby daddies. Um, so there was all these kids and daddies coming in the house, and she was pregnant again. She was a drug addict. She ended up um, having the baby, and, and this couple of, that Craig Rochelle knew, they were um, going to adopt the baby. And of course, they were so excited, and everything was, you know, the room was done, and, you know, so excited. So she has the baby, and at the last minute, she decides to keep the baby. And it just threw these people for a loop. They were just like, what just happened? What just happened? And, and at some point, they cried and cried, but they had to turn that corner and say, all right, that child was not supposed to be a piece of my puzzle. It just wasn't. I don't know. I have to trust God with my puzzle life. And, and it wasn't supposed to be. And they had to do with this. They had to believe in the character of God at the time when they had no idea what, they, what, what God was doing. And that is why the Bible, and that's why I always say, please, please read your Bible, because there are men and women who've gone through exactly what you've gone through, and they felt the hurt and the pain and the frustration of following God. For those of you who lost children in your life, can I show you this? So did King David. King David lost a baby and a couple sons at that particular, in his lifetime. For those of you that are here and you were raped, or maybe a child was raped, or someone you were raped, here you go. King David's daughter was raped by a stepbrother. These are all biblical characters. They know exactly what you're going through. Those of you that are estranged from your children, you're like, my children hate me and I don't know what to do. Well, King David also can understand that. He's estranged from his son who tried to take away his throne. And this wasn't even just an estrangement. This was, I hate my father so bad that I'm going to go take an army, go into Jerusalem, wipe him off the throne, set myself up, have sex with his concubines on the roof so everyone in Israel can see that I am now king. That's estrangement. And it was heartbreaking for David. And it was just heart, the whole scene was heartbreaking. But see, that's what I'm saying. These people in the Bible, they know what you're going through. How's this? people who feel like hate, that people are hate, out to get you. They hate you. You're just like, everyone hates me. Well, David was on the run for his life from, for years from King Saul. King Saul was trying to kill him. I mean, literally. And everywhere he went, there was Saul and his army, and they were, they were, they were all out to get him. Imagine living a life like that, not like a day or a month, but years upon years. David couldn't even settle down because Saul hated him and was trying to kill him. For those of you that have ex-husbands, like, my ex-husband hates me. Well, David's ex-wife, Michal, despised him. Like, you should, have seen, you should read about it in the Bible. Like, she just hated him and just made fun of him. And she was just like, you just make me sick. Like, that's how it was. Some of you are here and you lost the love of your life. Your spouse. Here you go. Jacob lost the, the, his wife, the love of his life, in childbirth with their second child. It was devastating to him because all he did, he just worked so hard for, for seven years and then another seven years because he loved this woman so greatly and then she dies. It's horrible. If you're here and you're having a hard time getting pregnant, well, you belong with Hannah, Elizabeth, and Sarah. They all had infertility problems. If you're tired of all the suffering of turning on the news and seeing the suffering of the world, well, so did Noah. Noah saw the tragedy of human suffering as the flood began rising and people were dying all around him, banking on the ark to try to get in. And he knew the world was wicked. There was not one person who loved God. And Noah had to deal with that for 120 years as he built an ark. Imagine seeing all the wickedness and the suffering. What do you do with that? Somebody said something funny. They said, I wonder if Noah included termites on the ark. <laughs> I'm like, that's a good question. Some of you, you not only lost your child, but you lost your money and you lost your health. So did Job. Job lost everything in one day. Some of you hate your job because you hate the people. Well, guess what? Moses dealt with whining people for 40 years, okay? I'm sorry. I don't feel sorry for you. If you, if you make it 40 years, we'll talk, okay? But, but do you see what I'm saying? These people in the Bible, you're supposed to go there and read it and be encouraged. Like, if Moses can make it, I can make it. Somebody said about Moses, it seems like if he spent 40 years in the wilderness, that even in biblical times, men avoided asking for directions. <laughs> <laughs> if your hopes and dreams have never come true, everyone's got hopes, they've got dreams. Here you go. Moses' Moses's dream of entering the promised land never happened. After spending 40 years with whiny people, and he never got to go into the promised land. Sibling rivalry, here you go. Cain and Abel, 
Esau and Jacob. It's all over the Bible. And it's there for us to read, to say, you know what, God, how do I get past this? It's there. Here's a sibling problem. All right, now, last night, um, Dusty went over to Sean's house, and Sean has a baby. Baby's probably six or seven months old now. Noah. Okay, Noah's so cute. So, so someone took a picture of Dusty with Noah, and he was holding him. It was like the cutest picture. So Dusty puts it on, I don't know, Facebook or Instagram or something, and he said, um, this is my nephew. So when he said nephew, I was like, oh my gosh, I have the funniest joke I'm telling everyone tomorrow. And so I tell him the joke, and Rob and Dusty stared at me. They go, I don't even get it. Okay, so here it is. I hope you get this, but you might, because you're women, and it might make sense to you. So here you go. A pregnant woman from Washington, D.C. gets in a car accident, and she goes into a deep coma. When she wakes up, she realizes she's not pregnant anymore. So she says, doctor, where's my baby? And he goes, oh, he goes, it was so interesting. You had two babies. You had twins while you were, you know, in, in a coma. But he said, they're fine. Don't worry about it. He said, you had a girl and a boy. And she goes, well, where are they? And he said, well, your brother came down, and your brother named them for you. And she's like, oh, my brother's not that bright. What, what could he possibly have named my kids? So he, she said, what did he name my daughter? And she said, Denise. And she's like, well, that's not bad. What did he name my, my son? The nephew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Men. You didn't get that, did you? Because men don't get things like that. <laughs> Here's this one. And if you come from a dysfunctional family, here you go. Joseph. Well, I'll give you the story before we even read that. Joseph has, he's the, the 11th son of, of, they've got 10 older brothers. But here's the dysfunction. His daddy, Jacob, loves him more than he loves the other 10. And so daddy, Jacob, decides to make a coat of many colors and give it to Joseph. Well, okay, how dysfunctional is that? If you have a lot of kids, don't treat one better than the other. You can't do that. It just makes for a disaster. But Jacob did this, and Joseph's ten brothers hated him and sold him to slave traders and then went home and tell dad, hey, Joseph was eaten by an animal and killed. Okay, how dysfunctional is that? Some of you are like, yeah, I thought I had a dysfunctional family until I read that, okay? So all you have to do is read the Bible and it will help you. That's just a small portion of the people in the Bible who basically have rotten tomato lives, but you know what? They persevered, they made it through, and they feel your pain. I don't think they liked their puzzle pieces very much either, but they always pressed forward and they always just said, all right, God, I don't like for Joseph. I don't like being in prison, but I'm going to believe you're doing something in my life. And here's what they all did. They allowed God to use their life puzzle. Because think about that. Thousands of years later, you and I have just put all these up on the screen. Thousands of years later, they, they gave us their life puzzles so that you and I would know this. God knows what he is doing with your life. He just does. So the question I want to ask you is, what are you going to do with your life puzzle? Because your choices when they become dark pieces like this, the, the, the prison, the cancer, the suicide, the loss, the divorce, when darkness comes into your puzzle, your choices are to walk away and say, my life is too rotten, I'm out of here. Or you can do what the people in the Bible did, and, which is what Jesus reminds us of in this. Jesus says this, I have told you these things so that, that, that in me you may have peace. In this world you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome, the, I've overcome the world. See, this life is filled with trouble. But what's interesting is that we see it all through the Bible. You can have peace and you can still praise God in the middle of trouble. Because these guys did. Look at what Job did after losing 10 kids, his servants, his, his, his money, everything wiped away in one day. Look what he said. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. How many of us, after losing all of our children and all of our wealth and everything, would be able to say, you know what, praise the Lord? And really mean it. But somehow Job does. And it's just this reminder that you and I can go through the dark times, the, the rotten tomato times, and be like, you know what, God, you're doing something. I don't even know what that means. King David after he lost his baby, lost his two boys, his daughter was raped, his, his son tried to take the throne, Saul was after him, that King David, look what he says. I will exalt you, my God the King. 
I praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. See, here's what I know. When you read the Bible and you see that, you go, okay, if they can make it through horrible circumstances, so can I. And a lot of it's like this. I was telling someone the other day, I said, I, I don't have a problem with going and getting counseling. and there, I have no problem with any of those things. But for some reason, this generation thinks that that's just what we should all do. When I say in Romans 12, it says, renew your mind. Renew your mind with the word of God. And when you can start seeing that all these guys and all these girls in the Bible went through tough stuff like you are, they didn't go see a therapist. They went to the word, they went to God, and they said, God, renew my mind. Help me to see this situation from your vantage point. How can you use me with all the bad puzzle pieces in my life? I don't know. I just think somehow society is telling us we should go one way when, when God's saying, you know what, just come to me. I can renew your mind to where I can make you not sad or, or not upset or not bitter. Or not. That's God's job. I don't know. That was my thought that just came to my mind. Here's our problem. We have people that surround us daily. And they surround us and they say, where's your God? Where's your God? Because your life isn't going very good. You know, he must not love you very much. He doesn't care because if he really cared, he would never have let this happen to you. You got to quit going to church. You should quit going to Bible study. Quit even believing in God because you know what? He just doesn't really care that much about you. Even Job's wife, after Job lost everything, look what his wife said. Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. It's amazing that God took everything out of Job's wife and life and left his wife. Okay, he's probably like, you kind of got that backwards, God, take her, okay, leave my kids, okay. But imagine your wife or your husband saying that, curse God and die. How, it's horrible. But look what his reply was, I love his reply. You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Should we only accept the M&M times in our life and never the rotten tomato times? And Job's like, no, you can't do that. And if you continue to read Job, God comes to him in a whirlwind and says, Job, I'm not even going to answer why all this bad stuff happened to you, but do you know who I am? Did you create this world? Did you create the waves and the, 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 the uh, ostriches? And did you, who, Job, who are you? And for like chapter after chapter, God questions Job. And at the very end, Job never even understood why God did that. But he loved God more because suddenly God became so big in his life. And that's what my heart is for us here. I want us to be able to stand strong. And the only way we can do that is knowing this trouble is normal. you got to get that. Because if we don't get that, we'll never be able to say in our heart that, that we're okay. I think Paul and I think Abby and I think most of you that are going through difficult times, I think they made it through this because of this. They believed with all their heart what God said was true. And in their own personal puzzle, here you go, they were committed to God's word and God's plan for their life, no matter how difficult it was. That's the point that we have to get to, where no matter what comes in, we just say, all right, God, it's a new puzzle piece. My husband walked out on me, new puzzle piece. I am committed, committed to you. And I'm committed that you have a plan for my life. For anything, the loss, the cancer, whatever has just come into your life, you're saying, you know what, God? It's a new puzzle piece that's entered into my life. Your puzzle's a jigsaw puzzle until it's all put together at the very end. And that's what we see with Paul. Now, that's what we've been learning from Paul. We gotta hurry because we're just now getting to Paul. When we left Paul, Paul had a rotten tomato life. Okay, because Paul was stuck in prison. He's been in Caesarea now, waiting to get to Rome. He's been stuck there for two years. All right? Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of what's going on. And the reason why I like to give history in classes like this is because, to me, when you see history in the Bible and it attaches itself to world history, it's like, oh my gosh, these things really did happen and it grows my faith to a whole new level. But last week, the last lesson, um, we saw Felix. Now, Felix was the governor at the time that Paul was, was in Caesarea. Uh, now what's happened between our last lesson and now is Nero, mean, awful, horrible Nero, we'll talk about him in a second, he called Felix back to Rome, and let's talk about Nero really quick, for those of you that didn't know that. Right after, at this particular time, Nero's in Rome, look at how horrible he was. 
A generation after the death of Christ, Christianity had reached Rome in the form of an obscure offshoot of Judaism popular among the city's poor and destitute. Members of this religious sect, which is being a follower of Jesus, spoke of the coming of a new kingdom and a new king. These views provoked suspicion among the Jewish authorities who rejected the group and fear among the Roman authorities who perceived these sentiments as a threat to the empire. So you see, you've got the Jews that hated this and you had the Romans that hated any Jesus followers at this time. In the summer of 64, now this is kind of key we're, because between now and, and uh, in about six years, Paul's going to be dead. So this is all happening really fast at this particular time. In the summer of 64, Rome suffered a terrible fire that burned for six days and seven nights, consuming almost three quarters of the city. The people accused the emperor Nero for the devastation, claiming he set the fire for his own amusement. This is how horrible he was. In order to deflect these accusations and placate the people, Nero laid blame for the fire on the Christians. The emperor ordered the arrest of a few members of the sect who, under torture, accused others until the entire Christian populace was implicated and became fair game for retribution. As many Christians that could be found, they were rounded up and put to death in the most horrific manner for the amusement of the citizens of Rome. Some of those ways was, oh, you're a Christian? Great. There's the lions, there's the Colosseum, and they're going to eat you and attack you. So, and everyone's going to laugh and cheer for you while, while, while you're dying that way. Like, that's what Nero was doing. And then he was taking people and he was tying them to, to, light, to, um, to like sticks and lighting them on fire. It was horrible. It was this horrible time to be a follower of Jesus because you knew that could be your fate. Following Jesus meant something back then to people. And that's how Nero wanted to light the city with Christians burning. Horrifying, horrifying times. But where we're at right now, it's about 59 AD, about five years before this is going to happen. And about seven years from now, two years after the fire, Paul is going to die. And he's most likely going to be beheaded. So this is how he dies at this particular time. And then what's going to happen is that um, in 70 AD, so like Paul's going to die around, what, 66, 67. In 70 AD, the Jews are so sick and tired of Rome ro overruling them right now. So what happens is the Jews decide to overthrow Rome. They get together and they're going to come up against this big Roman empire, which was really stupid. And what happens is the Jews lost and Rome wins. Josephus, the historian, says 1.1 million Jews died in that conflict. Okay, this was a massive thing. And I'm going to show you this video. So this right here where you see, of course, the Dome on the Rock, this was where the site to uh, the temple was. Uh, it was Solomon's temple originally, and then the Babylonians came in and destroyed it. And then Herod, you know, then uh, later on, it was sort of rebuilt a little bit. Herod came in and built this whole big, beautiful building up there. Um, it was huge. It was white. It just was this, the pride of the Jews at that particular time. But what happened in AD, AD, AD 70 is when um, the, the, the came and was destroyed, that temple. It destroyed everything. When the Jews came and did this uprising, then this is all what, what's... So all this is going on right in the time of Paul. That's why I wanted to tell you that. So that's going to be gone and burned. Thanks, David. Um, so at the time, you can see this is where Paul is. Paul's stuck in Caesarea, and he's in prison, and he doesn't really want to be there. But you understand now that there's this big fight between the Romans and between the Jews, and everyone's trying to make one another happy. Oh, we've got to hurry. Okay, there you go. Let's run through this really quick. Acts 25, three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Isn't that amazing? Still, after two years, they're still trying to kill Paul. Um, Festus said, well, Paul is being held at Caesarea, which we saw that one video, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, press charges against the man there. If he's done anything wrong, after spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought into them. We're going to run through this really fast. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. We talk about this. Fake news, that's what's going on back then. Then Paul made his defense. He said, I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. 
Remember, there's this big frustrating thing with the Romans and the Jews. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before there on these charges? Paul's like, uh, no, I'm not doing that. I am now standing before Caesar's court. I'm in front of you, Festus, where I ought to be tried. I have done nothing wrong to the Jews as you yourself know. If, however, I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. In other words, send me to Rome. When I appealed to Caesar last time, you should have sent me, and you didn't. After Festus conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, so to Caesar you will go. And a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Now, we're going to add two people to this story. We've got King Agrippa and Bernice, and it is like a soap opera. Here you go. No, I don't watch soap operas. I have Facebook, and there is a new episode every five minutes. <laughs> but the Bible is kind of like a soap opera sometimes. Like, it's kind of amazing what happens. But I want to show you really quick who King uh, Agrippa and Bernice are because they're all a part of Herod's family. Remember Herod the Great? So you have Herod up there. He has a son. They all have uh, portions of this whole uh, what happened to Jesus and what happens to this early church. I'll come back to that in a second. Here's, the, here's Herod, King Herod, the top one. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. Okay, wise men come up, look at verse 2. Where is the newborn king? And Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard that. And then Matthew 2, 16, Herod was furious. So he sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and Bethlehem who were two years and under. So that part of the, um, the Christmas story, this is Herod the Great. Okay, so let's go back to... Um, this. Then he had all those kids. One of his sons was Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the one who had John the Baptist killed. You see the Herods are bad, bad people. So he had John the Baptist killed, head on a platter, that whole thing. Then you have the next one. You have, um, who is the next one? King Agrippa I. He's the third one down the line. King Agrippa I. He's the one who had James, the apostle James, put to, put to death with the sword. He's the one who had Peter arrested. So all through Acts, you see these, this whole wicked family all the way through. And then that Agrippa the first had three kids. Uh, you had uh, the two that are in the story right now. You have uh, Agrippa the second and you have Bernice. So those are the two that are now in Caesarea with Paul and with um, uh, Festus, I think it is. Festus or Felix? Who are we at? Festus, I think. But look at that. Felix, the governor from before, he was married to Drusilla, Herod's other daughter. So see what I'm saying? It's just this whole weird soap opery line or lineage or whatever. So that's where we end. So now you know who's who. I don't know why I like to always tell you stuff like that. All right, so here's what happens. When Paul, are we into, okay, when Paul made his appeal to be held over to the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until he could send him to, to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. Tomorrow you will hear him. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, the, the sister and brother, who, by the way, they, the history says they had this really weird incestuous relationship, so they're just a weird family. Anyway, the two of them came with great pomp and entered the audience room with high-ranking officers of the leading men of the city at the command of Festus. Paul was brought in. I imagine these guys, in the, 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 um, Agrippa and, uh, what's her name? Bernice, I imagine them in a big purple robe and their crowns and they're walking in. And if you got to see that video, the one of Caesarea, it, the palace is right on the Mediterranean Sea. It's like this, it, it, the ruins are still there so you can actually go see it. But, but we're talking right, it's this big palace. You can imagine this pomp and circumstance and oh, the Herods are here and, and, and all this is going on. And then they bring Paul in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man, he points to Paul. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live anymore. But I found he'd done nothing deserving of death. But because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. Then Agrippa, in chapter 26, verse 1, said, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. Look at the first words out of his mouth. I think myself happy. I think myself happy. I, I, really? Okay. A woman walked up to a little old man rocking in a rocking chair. 
on a porch. She said, I couldn't help but notice how happy you look. She said, what's your secret for a long, happy life? He said, well, I smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. I drink a case of whiskey a week. I eat fatty foods and I never exercise. She said, that's amazing. How old are you? He said, 26. <laughs> but I think myself happy when I read that, I'm like, I don't think I would have that kind of attitude. Here's what I would be like. I'd be like, really? All of you listening, I've been stuck in this stinking prison for two years, falsely accused of things I never did. Your government is corrupt. You are ridiculous. The Jews are big, fat liars. Everything you say is fake news. And your stupid robes are seriously ugly. Okay. <laughs> That's what I would say. And on top of that, I'd be like really mad at God. Because I'm like, you told me you were going to get me to Rome, and you're not. And I would, be, I would be like the biggest baby. And I wonder if that would have been too hard for me. I wonder if I would have kept my faith. And I think that's something we need to all ask ourselves. Will I keep my faith when life seems to be too hard? When life, when God seems to be asking too much from you? When you say, you know what? I'm going through so much and I just don't think I can do it any longer. Please don't do that. Because this section teaches us this. Nothing in our puzzle pieces are ever too much. They may be for the moment. They may be when you first had your loss or your divorce or you found out you had cancer or your child is going to prison. It may be for a moment, but I promise you it's not going to last if you continually focus your mind and let God renew your mind and realize, okay, that's just a piece of my puzzle. God wants to use me. See, you and I have to be 100% sure of everything that God says is true. And if so, then you and I can do this. We can focus on the big picture of what God's doing. We just can. And I think regardless of our circumstances, our rotten tomato life, our bad things that happen, that we can say, you know what, I think myself happy. Because that's exactly what Paul does. Rob was having a really bad day the other day. He came home from work and he just looked at me and he goes, basically, I hate my job, I hate people, I hate life, I hate everything. Okay, that's kind of just the whole conversation. And he opened up his Bible and he was reading it and he looked at me and he goes, what's the deal with Paul? Okay. <laughs> Why is he so happy? <laughs> okay. I mean, how can he deal with the people and the circumstances and everything? And the only thing that came to my mind was this. Paul was laser focused. He was laser focused on his one job and that was getting the message of Jesus out. He didn't have time to hate people. He didn't have time to get his feelings hurt. He didn't have time for any of that. He's like, I just need to tell people about Jesus. Here you go. His negative circumstances never changed that. Never, in fact, I think it motivated him. Every time something bad happened, he's like, yes, something bad's happening. So now I have a whole new group of people I can share Jesus with. I could go to the prison system like Carol Kent does. I, you know, some of you in here that have cancer or got, or got past your cancer, you got a great story. For those of you who lost people from suicide, honestly, you can help people. Whatever your losses are, that's what I'm saying. It's like your, your negative circumstances never have to change that. He goes on to say this, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all things of which I'm accused by the Jews, especially because you're an expert in customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. What Paul sees is this, his negative false imprisonment. He does not see that as a bad thing. He sees that as a good thing because it's always something in his life that gives him a new group of people to share Christ with. So the question is, what negative thing is going on in your life? And how can you change your thought process to, this is horrible and bad, to this is good, because God wants to use me? See, I think this is what we need to do. Focus your life on God's purpose for your puzzle. They're all different. Focus your life on what is God's purpose for your puzzle. And if we get nothing else from Acts, it's this. Life is short. Live for Jesus. Bad things happen. Use the bad to point people to Jesus because eternity is at stake for everyone. And this is how Paul got there. It's what Abby talked about last week, surrender. See, you and I as Christians, I was afraid last week after we talked about the saved but not surrendered thing, it came across like you can be saved and never surrender. I don't think that's true. I think surrendering every puzzle piece to God is part of being a Christian. I think you just have to get to that point of going, all right, God, I'm giving this to you. All right, God, I'm giving this to you. It's just surrendering each puzzle piece to him. But I think that you probably aren't saved if you never ever even think to give things over to him. You might not even know what it means to be saved is my whole point to that. So surrender is something that you do as a follower of Christ. And it's a process. 
It doesn't just like you become a Christian and you surrender it all. I think it's something that takes time, but you should have. But there are some people that are here that say, I'm a Christian in name only. And you will never, ever get to the point of being like Paul if you're not a surrendering Christian who knows that God created you and wants to use your story. It's got to click in our mind. We have to go, I hate that when I can't finish my lesson. It makes me mad. All right, where shall we go? No matter whatever happens in your life, you're going to use it to tell others about Jesus. I'm going to use whatever puzzle pieces God gives me to serve him. We're going to pass by all of Paul's stuff. Here's what Paul, he was in chains. He told everyone about Jesus. The chains mean nothing to Paul, but his salvation message means anything. Whatever your bad puzzle piece in should mean nothing to you. But what should mean everything is the message that you have to tell other people. Now, I'll end here. Some of you are at a place where something really bad just happened. Yesterday, last month, three months from that here, and, and you're just, you, it's just all brand new to you. And here's what you need to do. You need to grieve your losses. You do. Grief is something that you need to get through. Grieve things that didn't go your way. Grieve the unwanted puzzle pieces. Grieve your rotten tomato life. Because with every time something bad happens, this is what you have to say. I guess this is when I really find out if I believe what I say I believe. Do I really believe it? Some of you are reeling for something that happened. But here's what Craig Rochelle says. He talked to a counselor. I don't think I wrote this. Before I do that, I'll... Craig Rochelle was talking to a friend of his. It's a counselor on the horrible things that people have to deal with. So he asked the counselor, he said, what do you tell people? when they come to you with unimaginable bad things that happened. And the counselor said, I tell them the truth. And the truth is this, I don't have any good reason for what just happened to you. I don't know. But I knew, know, do know that God can use this for greater good. And Craig says, do you actually believe that? And he said, I do. It took me a long time because he shared his own story of abuse and all that. But he said something, and this is what we need to remember. Sometimes we have to grieve the losses in our life because we can clear, before we can clear a space inside where our faith has room to grow. It made me think of this. Some of you have this. You, nothing's bad in your life. Your life is filled with faith. It just is. It's just, you know. But then something happens. And you know what? This is grief. And the faith is eaten up by grief. That's what happens. And he's saying this. Grieve your losses, but don't stop there. Don't let it overwhelm your life to where you can never be used anymore. But instead, as your faith begins to grow, it opens up spaces. Here, your grief goes away, and it makes more room for your faith. It doesn't mean your grief is going to always go away forever, but, it, but what you see is now you've got a lot more space in here for faith. He said that's the only way to grow closer to God when terrible things happen. Here's what you need to know as we end. Your loss, whatever it is, is a puzzle piece in your life. Grieve that loss and then use that loss to point other people to Jesus. Because that's what we learned from Paul, that there is hope in the dark. We can believe God is good when life is not. Please do not ever give up. And know this once again, life is short. Live for Jesus. Bad things happen. And then use the bad to point people to Jesus because eternity is what is at stake. Whether your friends go to heaven or hell is at stake. It's serious. And God wants to use your puzzle pieces to get more people into heaven. And if they see you reacting in a, in a positive way that Paul does, you will change the world. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Paul's life and everything he's taught us over this whole series in Acts. God, I pray for each person here this devastated by something that's come into their life that feels dark, feels like they're never going to get over it. But God, I pray that they will take from Paul and they'll start taking the grief out of their life and filling it with faith so that they can be a witness and someone who's out there that can be a light for you. I pray that for each person in here. In Jesus' name, amen.